All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, as people come in from lunch, um, uh, we'll just you know just make sure that they understand what's going on. And I am really excited about this next panel. Uh, I'm really excited about introdu and and having these panelists speak. Um, this is a topic and a and an issue that has been on my brain probably for the last uh, four or five years and thinking about what this means both in the context of of retaining and keeping really great brilliant hardworking passionate advocates and then really also improving the idea of improving the diversity and the inclusion of people from impacted communities as advocates for those communities but knowing that there are pitfalls and there it's not just uh it is something that requires some thought and intentionality and sometimes some hard work. So I'm really excited that this panel is gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and pass it to Camille. Thanks, Linus. Um, hi, everyone. I hope you all have enjoyed this morning's panels. Uh, we hope to give you all a little bit of a break in terms of soaking in the substance of immigration law and policy and shift a little bit to talk about um, practice and what that looks like um, for us um, on the panel, um, especially as I think you can tell women of color, right? Um, and yeah, so I guess we can jump in uh, into introductions. Uh, I think our introductions will be a little bit uh, longer than in other panels um, because you know in the work that we do, um, there, I don't think there is a way to um, separate um, who we are and our identities. Um, that's fundamental to how we are perceived in the system and how we show up for ourselves and our clients and our communities. Um, so uh, I'll start and then we can go one by one introducing ourselves, what we do, uh, and to the extent that it's relevant. It's relevant, very relevant. Um, a little bit about our personal background. Um, yeah, so I'm Kimberly Medina. Um, I'm an alumna of the University of Minnesota Law School. Um, I spent, I think, all of my time during law school in the Binger Center for New Americans. So this space is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm currently a practitioner in residence um, at Seton Hall University School of Law, where I practice almost exclusively detained uh, removal defense, and the bulk of my work is at the intersection of criminal and immigration law, um, and a little bit in terms of my personal background. Uh, first generation, a lot of things, um, American student of higher education, lawyer, uh, Latina, grew up in the South, uh, and came to law school uh, in Minnesota, the middle of nowhere, um, not knowing anyone. And so, um, yeah, I knew uh, growing up as a member of a mixed status uh, family and community that this was the kind of work that I wanted to do, but it really wasn't until the uh, 2016 election cycle um, that I kind of honed in on what exactly it was that I wanted to do and noticing the increasing criminalization of non-citizens and in reality people who maybe question our ideas of what a citizen may look like. Um, that really uh, was the impetus for me to, to join the detainee rights clinic um, and really um, was pivotal to my uh, the journey uh, in my legal career. So that said, uh, Amanda. Hi, my name is Amanda Stokes. I am currently a trial attorney at the Hennepin County Public Defender's Office. I started at the office when I was 23, straight out of uh, college. I started as a legal assistant. I went to law school at night at Mitchell Hamlin. Uh, my last day as an assistant was the day before I started as an attorney. So I've been there my entire career. Um, no plans on going anywhere else. I always knew I wanted to be a public defender. Um, I also currently teach at Mitchell Hamlin uh, School of Law as well. Um, I am Colombian. I was born in Bogota, Colombia. I was adopted as a child um, into a white family. I was raised in Rochester, Minnesota. Um, I have a younger brother who is from the same orphanage uh, that I was born at. And the reason, one of the reasons I wanted to become a public defender was because he uh, has been in the system since he was a juvenile. Um, so I've seen how the system has treated him. 
I have also, uh, as someone who was raised in a very white town, um, was pretty consistently pulled over by police for reasons that were not uh, correct. So I was treated differently as well. Um, and so I always knew that I wanted to do this kind of work. Um, and I hope that I'm doing it for a very long time. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Gonzalez. I'm a staff attorney at Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid. I've been there now for a little bit over a year now. And what we do there, what I do there, uh, we I do affirmative asylum cases or not affirmative asylum affirmative cases in front of USCIS. So um, special immigrant juvenile status, adjustment status cases, naturalizations, um, applications, um, and then also some detained work. Um, before that, I was an immigrant justice core fellow placed in uh, Safe Horizon, which is an organization in Brooklyn. Um, and then I did go to St. Thomas um, and participate in VB <laughs> and was in the Immigration Law Project Clinic as well as the Immigration Appellate Clinic. Um, and I, I kind of always wanted to knew I wanted to be a lawyer since I was pretty young. Uh, I was born in uh, Los Angeles, but I was raised in the south side of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So um, big black and brown communities that... I was able to understand at a very young age uh, the racism in our systems and uh, over-policing within our communities. Um, and so that was the stepping stone of me wanting to follow this path. Whoa. <laughs> um, I've been around for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> And I know a lot of you. Um, it is so incredibly uh, honoring to be here, uh, sharing space uh, with all of you, uh, talking about this uh, very important topic, which we could go on for months. Uh, but, you know, for me, um, I, I grew up in Mexico and I came when I was 18. So I had a very strong sense of who I was. And I always credit that strong sense and that women who raised me to be uh, a very resilient person for being able to handle the society that I ended up in. I never talk about myself as an immigrant because I am an indigenous woman and uh, my community, my, the nations that I come from have always been uh, on this continent. We believe we sprung out of caves many, many years ago. And I believe the occupation of the United States or our lands will end one day. And we indigenous people will be again resurgent and our cultures will be again very visible. And you can see it now. I mean, every day we're seeing it more and we are hearing about children being taken away from indigenous tribes. And unfortunately, we're relieving the situation at the border with children being taken away from their parents. So the, the colonization and the occupation continues to trying to uh, completely obliterate our sense of being. And so every day I walk out of my house, I know that that's what I am up against. And it is hard for me to believe that I'm still a lawyer and it is hard for me to believe that I uh, was ever a lawyer. Um, but I remind myself when I go out that I have this great responsibility to keep up this struggle because I have that privilege of being a lawyer. And um, went to law school, I actually the U of M, uh, I love the U of M. Um, I went to school here, graduated in Chicano studies. And this is where I got my, you know, my first um, experiences in law and uh, also with activism and, you know, being an artist, I'm an artist as well. Um, and to see how the war works, um, it saddens me that now, day after day, there will be a shrinking um, body of attorneys of color entering the profession because of all the work that is being done to dismantle the, the ability of black and brown people, indigenous people to, to go into school. 
not just the uh, higher education, but you know, law school. And so um, I think I was really privileged to also have been able to go to, to law school. And um, I said, I suggested that we started this panel by saying, if you feel that it's racism, it is. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of like what I want. Uh, if, if I want a young me out there, right now sitting there, I would say, yes, it is. <laughs> Your gut's telling you the right, you know, what's going on. And then just, you know, that's not going to be your fault because you're just going to do your work. And um, and that's uh, who I am. I've been a lawyer for 23 years. And before that, I was, uh, as a law student, I got an um, internship to uh, work with uh, Oficina Legal. And I met the legends there. <laughs> I was on there, Karen Ellison and... Um, uh, John Keller and Leonor Milbergeri. And then I went to Central Legal and I worked with other legends there like Ben Casper and um, other legends. Oh, in fact, Susan Castro, the lawyer, the uh, judge worked there as well. Um, and so, you know, I think like I've been around for way too long. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to have been invited. Thank you. Thanks, Susanna. Um, so I guess I just wanted to go off of your point, um, talking about law school, right? Because right now, um, I think we can talk about practice, but I think a lot of our experiences go way back. Um, and so I just wanted to start off, um, by asking, um, about your all experience that because I think anyone in this room, whether current uh, law students, um, practicing attorneys, or really anyone that knows anyone that's ever gone to law school can say, law school's hard, or at minimum, it sounds hard, right? Um, but I think we can also agree that law school is very difficult, and even more so, perhaps for people who are underrepresented um, in the profession. Um, and so I just wanted to ask you all, um, what was the experience uh, of law school like being, uh, being yourself, just going through law school? Was that like uh, any challenges that you faced uh, because of your identities and how you dealt with it? Um, I will start and you all will hear this a lot from me um, over the next 45 minutes, but most of my challenges with my identity have stemmed from the fact that I was raised by the whitest people you've ever seen. My parents are both straight from Sweden, um, and they did everything that they could to raise me and my brother as um, recognizing our identities. We had Colombian Christmas. We spoke Spanish as children. Um, we were in Spanish immersion. But that definitely changed when I got to college and then when I went to law school. I went to college uh, in Alabama, so that was a very different experience. That was a culture shock for sure. Then I came back up here for law school. Um, and I, this is not something that was unique to law school, but it became more apparent to me in law school. Um, people treat me like I am not Latina, like I am not Hispanic because I get told I, I sound white um, or they see my parents and they say, well, you have white parents. Um, and I think that I've consistently been left out of conversations um, that I probably should be involved in about being um, an attorney of color, about being a Latina attorney. And that that happened in law school. And it happens at my current job now, um, not maliciously, but I think people just don't understand what it's like to struggle with that identity. Um, so that was the biggest thing that I struggled with in law school. I think that colored my entire law school experience, which was overall great. Um, but there are certain instances where I can look back at them and be upset that I was left out of rooms that I feel like I should have been in. I guess for me, um, it goes back a little bit further, I mean, back than law school. I think for me, it started going into college undergrad. So I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And so I, similar to Kimberly and many of us, I was first generation, everything, first generation born in this country, higher education and lawyer. And so having to navigate going into undergrad 
was its own challenge. But then wanting to go to law school was another thing. It's like studying for the LSAT, um, taking prep courses. How can I afford that? So it started in the beginning. But then I guess in law school, I, it, yes, it was hard. Um, but at the same time, I had already had experience navigating white institutions. So then because of that experience, I was able to find resources, find people, build community, uh, make friends in law school that I'm still really close friends with today. So I think um, the whole navigating process of it um, started since high school, basically. And I think um, we see that across the country. I know you mentioned education. I think uh, especially with uh, locations or communities where I'm from or so mature where I'm from, there a lot of schools are very underfunded and um, there isn't a lot of resources for students. So, um, yeah, I think that this it's a larger system in terms of how can we get access to higher education and how can we make that ex accessible now, especially with the tuition and everything raising and uh, being able to afford that. And so I think it's a huge culmination of a lot of issues and challenges for people. And I can see how. Um, just navigating throughout that is difficult. And that's why I think it's important to have resources and space for people to build community, but also support each other along the way. Yeah, for me, it was um, very different because I was a non-traditional student. I had children. Um, when I started at the U, I was pregnant with my first one. And then when I started at the Humphrey, I had just given birth to my second one. Um, so, you know, going to law school with a baby is a lot of fun. <laughs> um, yeah. I'll tell you a story. This is funny. I was preparing for my first final for torts. And my son, who was like five, you know, I, I had a little desk. I lived at the U, in the housing over there. And I, you know, I did a summer program at William Mitchell. And I was doing my torts prep. And um, I see this little thing running with cookies in a plate to bring me because I was studying. And then he tripped and hit his head uh, on the coffee table and opened like I don't know, about a couple of inches. And um, so I ended up scooping him up and taking him to get stitches. And then I, you know, you can't study if you're, I don't know if you're familiar with the emergency rooms, but especially, you know, when you have children and you have to wait and then they go home and they're tired. So, um, you know, he got stitches and then, you know, I went into my, my test and that taught me a lot because it taught me that I could never procrastinate. <laughs> you have to get it done. Uh, otherwise your children will open their heads and then <laughs> you won't have time to study. Um, but my, uh, you know, this whole time, I think I I can can't say it enough how much I benefited from these programs being out there, because I had been out of school for seven years when I started my uh, undergrad in Mexico. I graduated from normal school. If you're familiar with normal school, I became in Mexico a professor, and I had you know a year uh, teaching in Mexico, and that's why we're called professors. And then I came here and then I didn't go to school. And then I, when I went back to school, I had no skills. English is not my first language. So I had to start by learning from zero, you know, math from zero, writing from zero. And then I finally went through school. So um, going to law school to me seemed like a real big accomplishment. And uh, having the um, opportunity to also do it while there were programs to support me was really a, a great experience. What was not a great experience was the racism. And that just was every single day. The first day of law school, I had a guy from the South. He was about like 6'4", about 300 pounds, like huge guy. Come and tell me that I didn't belong in law school, that I had to go back to wherever I came from because I was only there because I was brown. And that was the first day. So that experience, um, you know, I don't think anybody has that experience. So raise your hand if 
some huge white guy told you that. Um, but I knew I, you know, I, I belong at the school. But the schools are not set up to help uh, deal with those kind of things that happen because they kept happening. And the problem is that we, as women of color, are then asked to sit on a panel or to create a task force or to somehow, you know, become the justice enforcers and, uh, you know, of racism. And so that wastes a lot of your time. And I did. I I had to engage in all of these different groups where, I don't know, people said like mea culpa and the brown people had to say, okay, we forgive you. Uh, and that's really, you know, distracting. So I would have liked to have an experience where I could have just focused on my education and not have to focus on my race. And um, as an attorney, that also happens because I, I like to see a show of hands, how many of you have been asked or told that there is already an interpreter in the courtroom and that your services are not needed that day? None? Yeah, do you have? Okay, two. Yeah, that happens. That happens to us. Um, you know, I use white privilege when I can. I'm married to a white guy. <laughs> and uh, um, I, yeah, if I have to call like Candy Ohio County, I'm like, hey, you call them. <laughs> and I, this is what I want you to tell them, right? Um, so um, it is, you know, it is present every day in the work we do. And how we choose to work with it to not affect our clients is very important. So I could have spatted many times with um, different people, you know, on the other side, maybe judges, maybe government attorneys, but I choose not to because it will affect my clients down the line. And there are times when I say something, but I say it in a different way. I will file a motion and I say all kinds of shit in my motion. <laughs> and then I just have the judge not do anything with my motion. But then it's different, right? I'm not taking it directly to the person who did it. I just say, oh, this is what the government did to me. And then the judge goes like, depending which judge it is. Oh, okay. Or they will say, what? They said that the rules of the court are onerous on them, you know, and there will be at least a record. And I think that's important to, to keep on bringing up in ways that are not going to harm our clients. I think we've heard a lot this morning about how the systems that we operate in are designed that way. Um, they are systemic. Um, and so it makes sense that we would have these experiences growing up, um, you know, in childhood and adolescence. And then once we get to higher education and once we get to law school, and as you mentioned, Susanna, it doesn't stop uh, when you're an attorney. I think sometimes when we reach that goal, right? We think we've reached the pinnacle of it all. We've passed the bar exam. We got through law school. We're now attorneys. And in theory, right? We should be recognized as such. We should recognize ourselves as such. Um, but I think as we all um, have probably experienced, um, uh, we sometimes question our um, our roles as attorneys and society does. I mean, Susanna, you mentioned uh, being mistaken for an interpreter and I fully suited in immigration court was asked by a judge whether I needed an attorney. And so that just goes to show that as much as we, I guess, do all of the necessary things and take all of the steps to do what it is that we need to do, unfortunately, the system in which we operate may never see us that way, right? Um, and unfortunately, I think that's expected at this point. But I was curious um, to hear from you all if there were any situations in which your identity maybe impacted your work, your career, in a way that might have surprised you. Um, and I just wanted to share uh, very quickly, because 
again, it's not surprising at this point that everyone that we work with, including opposing counsel, judges, staff at the immigration court, whatever it may be, that they may not see us as attorneys. Right? But, you know, I've had experiences lately now that I'm on the other side practicing that where I have felt othered even by my own clients. And that was shocking to me, um, you know, practicing immigration law, being somebody from impacted community, I was very shocked when a client of mine uh, was expressing, you know, frustration about um, long adjudication times for applications and, and feeling desperate about not being able to work lawfully while he was receiving public benefits. That, And I, and I mentioned that only because this, this client uh, in particular had kind of like an air of arrogance about him. And so sometimes, you know, uh, these these are our clients, right? Especially the work that I do. It's a universal representation model. So in essence, it's, I, I'm, I'm what Amanda is, but in the immigration space, I don't pick my clients. My clients, so long as they meet all of the eligibility requirements for the work that I do, I, I do the work, right? And so this client <clears throat> told me uh, in the midst of all of his frustration that he, I, his attorney, sim I guess simply because I was an attorney, his attorney, um, didn't have a clue what it was like to be an immigrant in this country. And kind of stopped me in my tracks because I had no, no idea what to say because as I mentioned at the very beginning of this panel, I think our identities have impact every, every facet of our lives, right? And uh, every day that I go to work, I show up as an obviously non-white person and I'm perceived as such, right? Um, my name, I guess my last name, not Kimberly, of course, my last name and the way that I speak uh, Spanish, uh, of course, I, I think should take my clients off, right? That I, maybe I do have some lived experience that I, I could understand them uh, and their lived experience too. But I thought it was interesting, right? That I think we consistently feel othered by um, others in, in the profession. Uh, but to feel othered by my own client was, was quite interesting. So I was just wondering if any of you have ever had experiences like that where your identity impacted the work that you do in a way that you didn't expect. Um, how did you deal with it? I feel like my whole life I've been used to walking into a room and being probably the loudest person in there. Um, when I became an attorney, I did not expect to be respected as an attorney just based on my experiences up until that point. Um, but I didn't expect to have to fight so hard to be heard. Um, I've been practicing for about two and a half years now. Um, and I've been in front of the same judges pretty consistently for about a year and a half. And I feel like I just now I'm starting to have them realize that when I come into the courtroom and I'm arguing in front of them, I do know what I'm talking about most of the time. Um, and I try to be as prepared as possible. Uh, but I was in a sentencing last week and I was thinking while I was waiting for my client to be brought um, in from court holding about what I was going to say today. And in the middle of that sentencing, I looked around and realized that everyone in the room, uh, the judge, the judge's clerk, prosecutor, my client, and the three deputies who brought him in, every person in that room was a man. Um, and that was kind of shocking to me in that moment. And I think it was probably because I was thinking about what I was going to say here today. Um, but I just felt like even though I knew what was going on probably better than anyone in that room, I wasn't sure that anyone would listen to me. Um, that's been incredibly difficult just to kind of wrap my head around that. Um, and it does mean that I have to be more prepared. It does mean that if we were running a race, I'm starting a hundred meters behind everyone else and I'm having to fight to be recognized every time I walk into a courtroom, even if I've been in that courtroom a hundred times. I've also had experiences like Kimberly, um, where I've had clients be incredibly racist to me. Um, and that's difficult because I can't excuse myself from a case. I can't tell the judge, you know, I can't represent this person. I have to continue to do my job um, always and at the same level for every client. And I've experienced that very rarely, thankfully. But the times that it, that I have experienced it have been um, really shocking. It, they've they've said things that will remain with me probably for the rest of my career. Um, so I think that's something to keep in mind as, you, you know, people who are going into practice or people who are practicing currently as attorneys of color, um, like Susanna said, it is racism and you don't have to accept it. Um, but the unfortunate part of it is that you have to continue to do your job the same way that you would if these things hadn't been said to you.
I agree with a lot of the things that you both said, um, but I, I, I guess the experiences that I have experienced are not surprising um, because of what I mentioned, having to navigate white institutions in undergrad and then law school and then now as a practicing attorney. So unfortunately, they're not surprising. It, I guess, like you said, we have to be able to navigate these spaces for our clients. Um, and then that, that's why I also think it's important for us to build community and to be able to talk about these things because they do happen. And a lot of the times we're not, um, it's not really talked about. Um, so that's why it's kind of surprising that we're talking about it now, but I feel like we don't really open up the space to talk about these issues. Um, and then again, similar, I have also been mistaken by an or an interpreter or things like that. Um, but in a way that I think my identity does impact my work is with my clients. I think it's incredibly powerful to have for a client to have an attorney who looks like them, who speaks their language, who understands maybe their cultural background and what it feels like to have family separated. So I do think in a way having more like attorneys of color does create a good impact with clients, but it does take a toll along the way to get here. I think every day I want to uh, empower my clients to feel that they belong and that they deserve um, everything and that they should not ever feel ashamed of wanting to find a job or um, a way to support their families. And I, I want to tell everyone, I want to tell the world, right? that you have a right to be here. You have a human right to have shelter and to have food. And so every, every time I, I talk to my clients, I you know, try to, to bring that up and to, to help them see themselves uh, not as what the government has labeled them to be, but to who they are. And to me, that has been really surprising to find many clients that um, get, get married to uh, people who are extremely racist and or people who have internalized racism, who then, you know, uh, you know, exhibit that in, in my office. And so it's, it's very difficult to try and navigate that and to still give the other client, you know, like sometimes you have a couple, um, this, this power that they have. And I am unapologetic. And so um, I don't know if you know, but I'm infamous for pay, fighting against racist people. And I actually hit one of them. And then I became really famous on TV. Um, and then green letters were coming out of my mouth. Like, you fucking go back to Europe. You came across the ocean. You know, like all that stuff. And, and that is really my persona. Like, I believe that 100%. So uh, sometimes when I find these type of clients, it's easy for me uh, sometimes to not take a case um, because I don't want to deal with the racism. What is difficult and surprising is when you don't realize uh, that it's happening and then it hits you in the face. And... Um, and then, then what do you do? Uh, and so, uh, you know, those are ethical dilemmas, I think, for us as attorneys, uh, because we have a lot of rules to follow. And like you said, you know, you, you don't have um, the luxury of withdrawing or, or sometimes leaving a case because it doesn't rise to the level of the ethics that, that allows you to do that. So you really have to, and, and this is very difficult. How do you take your uh, identity and your persona and split it? And then, you know, just leave this part that's the, the advocate and the attorney. And I, I've been surprised by that. The other thing um, that I've been surprised by is, you know, I usually deal with people who come from similar class background that I come from. And I'm very proud to say I grew up hungry without shoes you know, always uh, threatened by violence. And that, you know, I think that's my rock. Um, and I've always grown up in barrios and, and, you know, all of the people I deal with 
are brown people. You know, when I come out of my barrio or I come out of my office, it's when I see white people, but I mostly don't. But I have clients who are very high class that come from Latin American countries that have this way of dealing with people that I was not expecting. So now I um, I expect, you know, this uh, like equality to happen. I, I expect the certification of society to have remained in the past. You know, I came uh, to, to this country in part because I hated stratification in Mexico. It's so high. And then suddenly it's in front of me in my office. And that's my client, you know. Uh, talking down to me. Um, and so that that's another a way of, um, you know, the, the high Hispanics or the high Latinos. Uh, uh, that, And there are attorneys like that here in Minnesota too, uh, that, you know, that you, they usually say, you know, not all skin is skin, um, that, where you don't really see eye to eye. But there's also not a real confluence of um, where you match uh, cognitively with someone and politically uh, that you could create a group. Um, I'm very isolated in, you know, my leftist ideals and all that. Uh, and as a woman of color, I am a lawyer for the National Lawyers Guild. I firmly believe in the principles um, that uh, human rights are more important than property interests. And, um, and through that work, I have also been able to, to have like this community of attorneys who are very progressive and leftist, but there's not a, like a higher, where do you get all these lawyers, right? That could be people of color that can uh, have the same ideas that you have. And that's, that's where I have found my community. And so I have a lot of surprises that I have found in the profession. And uh, and the, the the most painful though has been being an employer of uh, people that aren't people of color, because even in that there is this uh, inherent racism that occurs from your employees towards you, and that has been my the biggest surprise of my life. Yeah, so we've discussed a lot about how complicated and nuanced this work can be, especially as, as we do this work as women of color. Um, but there must, the fact that we're here talking about it and we continue to do it and you've been doing it for so long, um, means to me that the pros uh, outweigh the cons, right? And so there must be a reason uh, that we do this, um, and there must be ways in which we can continue um, to do this work. Um, so how is it that you can continue to do this work? Um, and and what do you do when when these issues surge and sometimes it feels like it's, it's too much? Um, I have a few answers to this. I think um, the first is when I passed the bar the day that I was sworn in as an attorney, someone told me that uh, I think two and a half percent of attorneys in the United States are um, Latina. And I think Michelle was saying a huge portion of my clients and our clients are Hispanic. Um, for them to have someone who looks like them in the courtroom standing next to them means something. Um, and I've been given this incredible privilege to go to law school and to become an attorney uh, that a lot of people will never be afforded. And so I have, I think, a duty to speak for people who can't speak for themselves and to defend people who would otherwise be defenseless um, against the government and against uh, specifically the police in Minneapolis. Um, so I take that very seriously. And I do love 95% of my clients. Um, <laughs> the remaining 5% um, don't change my mind about what I want to do. Um, and when it gets really difficult, because the work that we do is so trauma informed, um, I'm constantly hearing about other people's trauma and having no good answer for that. Um, but remembering that my clients have families just like I do and people who love them and these incredibly rich backstories that I'm getting to know um, makes me realize that 
you know, of course someone is mad at me. They're mad at everyone in the system because it's treated them poorly. So I try to keep that in mind. Um, the second big thing that has been helpful is the community of people that I work with. Um, I feel very lucky to be in the office that I am where everyone um, is incredibly progressive and is willing to have conversations that feel uncomfortable for them. Um, I think don't think that there are many attorneys of color in my office, specifically not women, but I am part of a group of people who um, have always supported me and or who are willing to listen to my experiences, even though they don't understand what I'm talking about. Um, and I had a conversation with my best friend this morning about, I don't need to educate other people's ignorance. Um, that's not my job as a as an attorney of color. That's not my job as a woman of color. Um, and I can do it if I feel comfortable, if I have the mind space to to support that, but I don't have to. And I have people who are willing to have those conversations for me, who are willing to come with me to talk to judges or my management when something uncomfortable happens. Um, and just knowing that I'm not alone has been super helpful. I'd have to agree with everything that you said, honestly. Um, but I think um, definitely for me, it's the community that I was raised by, by, you know, um, that's what it reminds me of their resilience, the work that I do. And I do think it's an incredible privilege to be, able to be an attorney. And so understanding that privilege while also coming from a mixed status family as well. So that uh, is what kind of drives me to do this work. I'm really passionate about passionate about this work. Um, yes, it's hard at times. And I think that we're opening up the conversation as to, you know, we always talk about resources for our clients, but also we as attorneys also need resources. We need to talk about mental health, um, ways to cope with, you know, you mentioned trauma and for, like a lot of our, our client stories, um, who have a lot of trauma and a lot of pain and hurt. So how can we as attorneys who are, you know, telling their stories, how can we manage that? And so I think people have to find, or I guess in the legal profession in general, not just in immigration, but being more open to discussing mental health and then also different ways to cope. And then, um, but yes, I think that our, because I'm early on in my career, I still am trying to figure out different ways to, I guess, manage or go along because you've been doing this for so long. <laughs> I'm like, I, you know, I want to do this for a long time too. So how can I make this work sustainable? And I guess ways that we can do that is yes, the community, the people that we surround ourselves by, uh, teams at work, making, um, creating that environment and support. Um, and then also as a profession, being open to talk about mental health and help for us, not just um, for our clients, but overall. I think it's really important to stay grounded. Um, and uh, for me, um, I am a general in the dance tradition. Yeah, I'm like a, a powerful medicine woman. Um, and that uh, grounding uh, has helped me spiritually uh, all the time, but uh, also uh, grounded in the community that I serve. It's easier for me, and it's very easy because I'm brown and I speak Spanish and I have all of these class uh, aff affinities with many of my dancers. Um, so it's really easy for me to just sit there and drink tequila with them and, you know have a great time um but it's also um really easy to go to rural communities in mexico with my clients um family sometimes because you know i happen to be dancing there and they come and see me at the plaza and then suddenly somebody will say who's susana and then oh i am you know and i'll be there barefoot dancing and people come and they say hi to me and I get a lot of presents. I get a lot of cheese and <laughs> peanuts. Um, no, really, and uh, uh, flowers, hibiscus flowers. And so um, that connection uh, really um, reminds me why I do this work, because I have met many, many people in really, like, remote places um, who know me because I help people in the town. And when people come up to Minnesota, they come to me 
because I've helped so many people in, let's say, Jolalpan, Puebla, a, a very Nahuatl speaking town, where they give me, they teach me Nahuatl when I go there. And, and so th those connections keep me really grounded and remind me again how lucky I am to be an attorney, not because I'm an attorney, but because I get to serve all the people that I serve. And every day, you know, most days I'm like, am I really an attorney? I, I question myself. But most days, whenever I'm feeling like a little bit lazy or whatever, I remind myself that I'm going to go and work and do great work. And every day I can help someone. And even if it's the smallest thing, like, a, you know, a phone call, people really appreciate it when I call them. And so I feel I made a difference in that person's life. And my day is just full of those moments. Um, full of frustration as well. You know, and I cry sometimes. And I like, I all have tantrums. <laughs> um, but I think that's also very helpful um, for our mental health. And um, having a very strong family support and having children who, you know, I don't know. You know how children are, right? They just tell it to you. And my children are uh, adults now. And so uh, they too um, are very, very, uh, a very strong part of my life. And getting, getting um, to see that the next generations are coming up and that I have had a hand in helping them get through college or going to law school and that I continue to do that um, all the time for the youth, that they can see themselves uh, in me. And I have a lot of young, I call them my little pandillita. I have a little pandillita, you know, a little gang. <laughs> um, well, we call her the sisterhood too. Um, la manada, you know. Uh, but where that, this manada is like the 13th manada I have had where I am influencing these young women to continue their education, whether they become lawyers or not. Uh, and so that, uh, to me, it's like, you know, our seventh generation idea uh, where we're working not for what's happening right now, but, you know, down the line. And so I'm super thankful every day for being a lawyer. Yeah, so in the work that we do, and I am speaking for myself, uh, specifically, um, because as, as I mentioned, I'm basically a public defender in the immigration space. And so that means, uh, I don't have a lot of winning cases. Um, I've been in my current role for three years. Um, and I just recently got my first two wins. Um, and so this whole time, uh, I've asked myself how it is that I can continue to do this work, um, when it, I, it seems I'm fighting all of these external factors mm -hmm. and, and internal factors. And so that's exactly right. I mean, community is important. Um, reminding yourself constantly of your why. Um, and, you know, having this openness and space to talk about these things. But one thing that I did want to know is taking account of what's in your control and what's not, right? I've had many times where I lose sleep um, thinking about what's going to happen with my clients because a lot of them, you know, fear for their lives, right? And I just have to take a moment and, and remind myself, I, at this point, I've done everything that I could have done. Um, you know, all the evidence has been filed, the briefings have been submitted, the clients and witnesses have been prepared. And so I've done it all already. Um, and so really the outcome is no longer on me, the powers that be, right? And so I think it's ultimately recognizing that and, and making peace with that. Um, let's see, I have about 10 minutes left. So I just wanted to gauge if there were any questions, um, from the audience, um, that anyone might have for us. Otherwise, um, go ahead and ask my last question. So anyone in the audience have any questions?
right. Well, oh, there's one. Oh, go ahead, Linus. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. So, you know, you and I actually have had this conversation since you were a law student. And now that you're a an attorney and all of you are practicing, when you do think back to law school, what are some, you know, I think you guys have done a great job in talking about how to perspectives on personal ways that you can individually try to cope with some of these. But what is it that perhaps, you know, institutions and how they need to change? And Amanda, I just go back to your comment. You know, you made a comment about how you would sometimes need to talk to management about having these uncomfortable conversations. What is it institutionally that we should really do to promote or support and really um, integrate more women and people of color and every other form of marginalization? Because as you guys point out, having you know, advocates who are who understand more about that type of marginalization is important. But I think a lot of times we don't really have not had a whole lot of conversations about what it is the institution and how you view what might. Yeah, I think um, I can answer, though I'll try to keep my comments brief if anyone else wants to chime in. Um, but so the first thing that comes to mind to me is, um, I don't know if you all saw, there is a like a pamphlet of sorts uh, out on the table uh, where you check in that talks about the center's, I think, goals for the next uh, four years and ways in which the center hopes uh, to accomplish these goals. And one of them, if I'm not mistaken, talks about centering the experiences of the people that we serve, right? Um, and I think that's the answer, you know, centering experiences of people like us in these conversations about how we run these institutions, right? I mean, I think I mentioned to you, um, Linus, um, in, in one L year, we had a law and practice uh, class where we, in theory, learned how to be a lawyer, right? Uh, we were given a fake case um, that dealt with uh, labor and employment issues, um, and we had a mock deposition. Um, and so um, I went into, you know, the mock deposition and there they threw a little bit of a wrench at mid deposition. Uh, and it turned out that the client uh, was undocumented. And for me, as someone who is surrounded by people who are undocumented, um, I didn't think much of it um, because I know it's a sensitive topic. And People don't like to belabor the issue. Um, you mentioned it, and, and for me, okay, noted. And I move on because I don't know that person personally. I don't know whether they want to continue to talk about this issue. And so I basically just set a mental note, thank you for sharing, and it kind of proceeded with the work, right? And the feedback that I got at the end of the deposition was that I, again, as a, uh, a member of a mixed status, family and community that I wasn't empathetic enough. Um, and it kind of shocked me, right? Because, you know, I have lived experiences that maybe I know a little bit more uh, than the professors about what was happening there and why aren't students who could possibly resonate with this being, um, being uh, incorporated into these conversations about different uh, activities or like initiatives that we could have. Um, and so that's what I would say, making sure that we're part of that conversation because um, maybe we know something uh, a little bit more than, you know, professors or uh, the institution about things that are, that are going on. Um, I don't know if anyone had any, anything other um, I was reading something about allyship yesterday. I read it on Instagram, but I'm still going to count it. Um, that being an ally means 
um, being louder than the oppressor, but quieter than the oppressed. And I think there's been a couple of administration changes in my office recently, but our current administration um, does a really good job of that. Um, they are sending people uh, not just to law schools to recruit, but also to colleges and high schools, um, because I do think that changing the institution needs to start earlier, um, because I didn't see people like me growing up doing this kind of work. And I think it's important that we're starting that as early as possible. Um, in my practice now, I feel very supported by my management in whatever decision it is that I make. I'm not forced um, ever to speak about something I'm uncomfortable on, but when I do choose to speak on it, um, I have support from top down in our management. So that's, uh, I think, how the public defender's office is currently trying to shift. I I don't have any solutions, but I do think that at least from my experience uh, and knowing other students of color in law school, I think a lot of these discussions have always happened. It's just kind of whether the institutions, whether or not listening or choosing not to listen or choosing not to actively do something. And it really just centers more about conversations versus actual steps into incorporating some of these things. So I don't have a solution, but I do think that a lot of these issues have been brought up, not just currently, but I feel like they've been going on for a long time. But um, I do think that certain institutions have certain goals and things in mind that sometimes don't really align with uh, or maybe choose not to align with uh, or focus on specific things. Um, where a lot of the times we see people be like diversity and inclusion, just one person is hired, but you know, there is a, really isn't any structure to it or any support to it. So I really do think um, people in institutions really need to think about what actual structures you have in place and what resources uh, you can create for, for students. I am lucky I've never worked in a place where I've had to, um, you know, uh, endure um, some of that behavior. But I think that from my experience with all the people that I had in my life through dance, it is really about sustaining that effort. Uh, it's, you know, continuing to, for institutions to understand that it's not just the recruiting and the um, attracting or having people of color on the brochure. I was in all the brochures of my school. Um, and, uh, and I continue to be. I recently was on the William Mitchell, I don't know, successful people, whatever. Um, but uh, but it is you know uh, just a continuation of, of the support for the students because it is hard to change um, what I would call the the principle of white supremacy. It's very 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 hard to change that. So I don't focus on that because that's very difficult. It will either die out, uh, people would evolve, or, or something's going to happen with that. But meanwhile, uh, just to have a very strong support for uh, for students at all levels. Thank you. Well, I guess we're about time. So thank you all for joining us in this discussion. A uh, discussion. Um, I hope it was fruitful for you, um, particularly those of you who might relate to some of our experiences. Um, and to those of you that maybe can't, I, I hope that this serves as a um, an opportunity for you all to lend support um, for anyone who might be experiencing um, some of these things that we talked about today. So thank you and see you later. <laughs>